amazing book, chapters 12, 13, and 14. It's hard to study one chapter without bleeding over to the other chapter as I was trying to prepare for this. But I found, and I want to introduce this, Alex, and I want you to take it away from what you received out of it. Verse 1 was amazing to me, and, and, and I, could, mm-hmm. I think I could preach a whole sermon on chapter 12, verse 1. Let me share with you what I'm talking about. First, the burden of the Lord, you know, of the word of the Lord against Israel, uh, a burden. In other words, when it's against them, it's a burden, and, and we should feel that way. That's the way preachers, yes, we preach the whole counsel of God, and sometimes it is difficult and harsh toward the sin that they're involved in, but it should be a burden for us, not just something, oh, we enjoy doing. But the, the part that really got my attention, notice what it says. The Lord, who stretches out his heavens, lays the foundation of the earth, and forms the spirit of man within him. Zechariah moves God from this massive God who is over the universe from the heavens, moves to the formation of the earth, to the spirit of man being important. That's who God is. This God is so big and so massive that he rules the universe, the heavens, but he's also able to speak into finite man. That is some statement when you put those three together, Alex. Well, it really is. It, it truly is. And, you know, um, I was thinking as you were talking about the burden of the Lord. You remember um, it talks about Jeremiah, the burden yes. of the prophet Jeremiah. Uh, the gospel is good news, but the, the good news contains some bad news. Um, the, the good news is if we turn to Christ, we can be forgiven and restored. But the bad news is if you reject Christ, there is judgment. And, and, you know, as much as we love the Lord and as much as we rejoice in the gospel, to realize that millions will uh, reject Christ to the detriment of, of their, detriment of their eternal soul, that's burdensome, isn't it? It really is. Now, after he does this, he moves from the spirit of man, and he basically moves toward Jerusalem. Now, this is, again, we, we try to teach here that you look at for repeated words in a book or in a chapter the word Jerusalem or the city of Jerusalem is mentioned 52 times in the entire book of Zechariah, which is just 14 chapters. And in these last three chapters, the city of Jerusalem is mentioned 22 times. So the comment is, if you're looking a way to look toward the future, keep your eyes on Jerusalem. That's not a bad advice, is it? No, Jerusalem is is like the uh, the thermometer of world history really and i have to believe as we uh, get closer and closer to the return of christ the middle east and the situation there and the city of jerusalem will continue to be a part of the news bert for as long as i remember i remember as a little little boy in the 1970s the news even back then was all about israel and jerusalem and it still is to this day isn't that interesting it is keep your eyes on jerusalem And here it says, Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of drunkenness. Now, usually, Alex, and and I think you you and I agree on this, that the cup, the references, I think there's one, I know there is in Jeremiah, and then Jesus talking about unless you drink from the same cup that I'm willing to drink of, it's usually judgment. And so here it is, Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of, of, of drunkenness, But then, and and he moves on to verse 3, it says those who try to deal with it, it's going to be a very heavy stone for Mm -hmm. all the people to heave, and it will surely cut in pieces. In other words, Jerusalem may suffer for a while, but when those nations or people who try to come against it and they try to heave it away like a stone, they will pay the price for messing with Jerusalem. Does that register? Is that what you see in this? Well, you know what? I've got a I've got a very good friend who's a White House correspondent named Bill Koenig, um, and he's um, been in Washington for many years. And I saw him this weekend in Arizona, and he was telling me, and Bert, it was just shocking. Every time that the United States has done something that's been kind of uh, detrimental to our relations with Israel, something terrible has happened within about. 24 to 48 hours, and even uh, 9-11. Now, uh, only God knows all the full implications of 9-11, but let me say whether it's America or any present nation or past nations, um, you trifle with 
uh, the nation of Israel at your own peril. And I think about this verse. Um, verse 5 says, The clans of Judah will say in their hearts, The people of Jerusalem are strong because the Lord Almighty is their God. Now, a lot of people are reluctant to admit that, but they will eventually, that there is a God. He's raised up the nation of Israel. Through Israel came the Messiah. And to this day, God is not done with the people of Israel. He really is not. And verse 6 says, in that day. Now, that is a repeated phrase. Again, I know I go to seed on this, Alex, but I, I can't help but my training is to notice the repeated phrases. And look, if you would, in verse 4, in that day, again, in verse 6, in that day, verse 8, in that day, in verse 9, and it shall be in that day. In other words, there's a day coming, and, and we are assured of that. I, when I look at that, it means probably in the future, as, as best I can understand the Scriptures, but it does say that is, is similar to what Jesus did in the book of John. In place of day, it says, my hour. In the book of John, the gospel of John, and they try to make him king. They try to arrest him. They say they do all these things. And Jesus will say, my hour has not yet come. My hour has not yet come. But over in the book of John chapter 12, guess what he says? My hour has come. So, so when I say this in that day, I understand we're waiting on some things to happen. And they will happen even though we say that it hasn't happened over these thousands of years, there's coming a day when God's going to set everything right, isn't he? Well, well, it is. And, you know, a lot of people believe, and, and I tend to uh, believe this, that some of these verses refer to the Battle of Armageddon. It's I talking about uh, the horses and the riders being struck with a panic. It's talking about the, the horses really being struck blind, which... Um, you know, I think that's that's literal, but also it uh, says in verse 4, and talking about this future date, and, and folks, hang on, because chapter 12 includes just an absolute bombshell of something that will happen at a future date, but um, it talks about all the horses of all the nations being blinded. That That's talking about the security and the armaments and the military prowess of the enemy nations being really... Uh, disarmed and put to naught. Let me say, armies can surround Israel, uh, the people can um, gather their munitions to fight against God, but God, truth, His purposes, His plans, His will will not be overturned, will they? They will not, and so you keep your eyes on Jerusalem, and notice it talks about the inhabitants of Jerusalem, verse 5, it talks about the inhabitants, the verse 7, verse 8, there's going to be protection. Now, there's going to be some of them wiped out. Half of Jerusalem will be gone and all of that. But God is going to keep a remnant. He always has. And even in these days when we're talking about the possibility of the battle of Armageddon, we find out God has his protective hand over the people that he has reserved for himself. And uh, those are strong statements. And it brings security not only to the nation of Israel, knowing that God's going to be watching them, and to a certain extent, and when I say certain extent, he will protect them, which does not necessarily keep them from falling into harm, but he has kept them as a nation and as a people. But when you reverse that, Alex, and bring it back to us, we have that assurance as believers that he would not leave us and he's not going to forsake us, but he's also going to see that we who are Gentiles, but we are followers of Jesus Christ, that he's, he's going to stay with us, isn't he? He's going to take care of us. Well, you know, he says, I will never leave you or forsake you. Uh, that's Hebrews 13. In that same chapter, it says Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. You know, we've often quoted John 10:28, 29, that says nothing uh, can pluck us out of his hand. So the believer grafted in, whether you're Jew or Gentile, when you belong to Christ, you are secure in Jesus. Now, we're... we're we're all going to leave this world at some point, either by death or by the return of Christ. But uh, in Jesus, we have eternal security, don't we? We really do. Now, I, you may want to go back further than this, but I, I really do want to get to verse 9 before the break, and then we'll come back yeah. and go through the rest of the chapter and get the phone calls lined up. But verse 9, let me read it and just take it from there. In, and it shall be in that day that I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. That is a flat-out statement, Alex. I, I don't know how you could uh, make spiritualize that. That that just sounds like a, a flat promise and a statement that's going to happen, doesn't it? 
Well, I've got to tell you, I think that um, some of the foreign policy experts in Washington ought to bear that in mind when they uh, look at who they build alliances with. <laughs> I, I agree with you. And even, I, I, you know, we don't necessarily get into the politics and exploring the word. It's kind of a reprieve for people during the afternoon. But we, we don't shy away from them either. The, yeah. Is it the one of the guys that has possibly converted to Judaism, and here I am speaking, and I know a little bit more about it than I'm letting, the, letting on know, but when he uses the word Jerusalem, he will, won't even say it Jerusalem. He says it with a, 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 an Arabic uh, word toward mm-hmm. Jerusalem, and he's in leadership in the, in the cabinet of our president. I, I, I find that very uh, alarming and even scary, mm-hmm. Alex. Well, remember, folks, that we're talking in in, um, Jeremiah 12 about events that will happen at a future point. Jeremiah was written about 500 years before Christ, uh, 5 to 550 years before Christ, and yet chapter 12 here is talking about future events. Now, there's an amazing, frankly, beautiful, uh, stirring event that it takes place in 10 through 14. But again, verse 9, on that day I will set out to destroy all all the nations that attack Jerusalem. Look, if all the nations that are enemies of Jerusalem are going to be attacked and destroyed, then I think I'm going to be on the side of Jerusalem. I do too. Look at where Jerusalem is. Look what's north of them. Look what is south of them. Look what is east of them. The only protection they have is the west, which is the sea, and uh, the gunboats could come there. They're surrounded by, quote, enemies who wants to wipe them off the face of this earth and big nations in Europe and in Asia even support uh, these countries coming against Israel. It's an amazing alliance that we have that I believe is forming for the last time when we will see Israel stand and all the other nations will come against Jerusalem and they will fall. Well, that's true. That's true. And, and Bert, how much time do we have before we go to break? 30 seconds. Here's the, here's the music. It starts right now, Alex. Okay. Well, uh, we've got more to come. This is Exploring the Word, Alex McFarland, Bert Harper, on the day of the Spiritual Town Hall meeting, which I hope you'll watch on truthforanewgeneration.com, 7 o'clock tonight Eastern Time. But until then, stay tuned, because after this brief break, Exploring the Word with more teaching and your phone calls is next, right after this brief break. 